Hi, this is McNew, and we are going to go over the cardiovascular system and more specifically the vessels today for our lecture. This is a lecture for my Anatomy and Physiology 1 students. All right, so we finished up the heart, and we were talking about the factors that affected cardiac output. And we're going to kind of segue into talking about the vessels as far as vascular resistance goes. So, first of all, what is vascular resistance? The definition is the resistance to flow that must be overcome to push blood through the circulatory system. Now, we know that the heart creates the blood pressure in our body. But there are factors that um, that affect the blood pressure. And we talked about cardiac output. Blood volume is another one. But resistance. So vascular resistance plays a role in our overall blood pressure. Now, just focusing on vascular resistance, there are some um, determinants or factors <clears throat> that play a role. The first one is blood viscosity. So this word viscosity, think viscous. And what that means is how thick the blood is. Now, blood overall is pretty viscous, pretty thick. And the reason why has to do with the proteins that are in the blood and also the cells that are found there. So, um, Generally, the blood viscosity doesn't change unless, for example, there is like less water within the blood. This could be because of dehydration. So if you're dehydrated, maybe your blood is more viscous. Okay, so that's what viscosity means. Now, how does this relate to uh, vascular resistance? Because the more viscous the blood is, it increases the resistance, okay? And the resistance is the resistance of that blood to flow through the vessels. <clears throat> so if you increase the blood viscosity, you're going to increase the resistance. If you decrease blood viscosity, you're going to decrease the resistance. All right, another factor is blood vessel length. Okay, blood vessel length. So, the longer the blood vessel, the greater the resistance. Now, so if you compare, like on the picture that you're seeing, if you compare uh, a shorter blood vessel to a longer blood vessel, the longer blood vessel is going to have greater resistance. It's going to offer greater resistance to the blood that is flowing through it. All right. A third one is vessel radius, or you could even say the diameter of the blood of the blood vessel. In this example here, it's showing you the radius, right, which is half the diameter. So as you increase the diameter, make the inside lumen larger, that is going to decrease the resistance. Okay? You're decreasing the resistance. If that blood ve if you compare it to a blood vessel that has a smaller radius or smaller diameter, this is this the smaller one is going to have more resistance. So as the diameter goes down, or, re, or radius goes down, then there increases the resistance. Now I do have a, a little animation to show you on um, blood vessel diameter. Now, there's no talking on this video, but a little bit of music. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to back this up. And I want to point something out to you. So when it's showing vasoconstriction, when, when it's showing vasoconstriction, that means the diameter of the inside of that blood vessel has decreased. And what that's going to do to the vascular resistance is it's going to increase the vascular resistance. So if you decrease the diameter, it increases the vascular resistance. Now let's see what happens if you increase the diameter. Vasodilation. You're increasing the diameter of that blood vessel and so that decreases the friction on the inside, the, the resistance to flow, and therefore the, resi the, the resistance, vascular resistance goes down. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk, start talking about um, some specific types of blood vessels, and we're going to start with the arteries. And the reason why I'm starting there, I'm just kind of, because we just left the heart, okay, and we're going to kind of pretend that we're blood. So we're leaving the heart and we're in an artery, right, because arteries carry blood away from the heart. So there are two major categories of arteries. There are elastic and muscular, okay, well there's more than that, but two major types of arteries. Elastic and muscular. <clears throat> now first the elastic. The elastic arteries, why are we talking about those? Because for one thing, elastic arteries are the arteries that are attached to the heart. So these elastic arteries are the ones that are going to receive the blood from the heart. These are known as conducting arteries. All right, these are the conducting arteries. These are the thick walled arteries near the heart. Uh, so think the aorta and its major branches. These, are, these elastic arteries have large lumens. Now, you've heard me talk about lumens before, and lumens, lumen would refer to the inside opening, okay? A lumen is an inside opening. So the inside opening of these arteries are quite large. Now, what you just learned about resistance, the large lumen will allow for low resistance in that conduction of that blood. So the larger the lumens, it decreases the vascular resistance. Now, these blood vessels, these elastic arteries, they play a role in blood pressure accommodation. They are able to withstand and smooth out large fluctuations in blood pressure. So if we can imagine this picture right up here, the heart contracting, the, the, the heart contracting and squeeze, creating that blood pressure and squeezing that blood out of the ventricles and into those arteries. And so the arteries have to expand some to take on that blood. And you can imagine that happening with every time the heart squeezes and forces that blood into the arteries. It has to have some give to it. And it has to be able to stretch and take on that blood. Okay. And it having those thick walls will help to accommodate that. Now, as we move from the elastic arteries and they branch even more, they're gonna be branching into what we call muscular arteries. So muscular arteries are more, we kind of think of those as distributing arteries because they're, they're the ones that's gonna distribute the blood to all of the major organs and all the different places in the body. These, um, if I had to describe where they're located in relation to the elastic arteries, they are distal to the elastic arteries. And like I said, they are going to deliver that blood to the body organs. Now, muscular arteries. In lab, you learned those wall differences between elastic arteries and muscular arteries. And even looking at the picture that I have here 
on your PowerPoint, you can see a difference. Okay, you can see that difference in the walls. Now the muscular arteries, what I do want you to look at here is this muscle layer. Okay, the tunica media. The tunica media is that muscle layer. And that muscle layer allows for vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Now, vaso means vessel. Constriction means to make that lumen smaller. You're constricting the lumen, constricting the flow of blood. Vasodilation, vaso means vessel, dilation. To dilate means to make that inside bigger. <clears throat> so, if I say that the muscular arteries are active in vasoconstriction, okay, they play a role in blood pressure accommodation as well. So, our arteries are going to help, help somewhat with blood pressure. Okay, so they do factor into, um, it is one of the factors that will determine the blood pressure. So if I ask you the question, if a, if a muscular artery vasoconstricts, is that going to increase the blood pressure there? Or will it decrease the blood pressure there? It's going to increase the blood pressure. That's right, because anytime you're going to decrease the diameter of that lumen, vasoconstriction, you're going to increase vascular resistance, which in turn is going to have an effect on your blood pressure. It will increase the blood pressure, the pressure on the blood, the pressure that the blood is exerting on the walls. Okay, so distal to the muscular arteries are what we call arterioles. Okay, so arterioles are the smallest arteries that we have. And you can see the picture that I have here on the PowerPoint. Now, when we compare the walls, we see that the walls are much more diminished in the arterioles. Now, arterioles are going to lead into the capillary beds. So arterioles, if we notice, oh shoot, hold on, I gotta go back. If we notice that the, here we still have a muscle layer. It's not quite as thick, of course, as the muscular or the elastic arteries, but there still is somewhat of muscle cells there. And, um, the arterioles can constrict and dilate, and they will help to control the flow into capillary beds. So yes, arterioles do have the ability to vasodilate and vasoconstrict. All right, now that leads us into the capillary beds. So the capillary beds, just paying attention to the capillaries. The capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in our body. The walls of the capillaries are usually one cell layer thick. Some of these are so small that one single red blood cell fits through at a time. So in our capillaries, most of our capillaries have numerous pores in them and which allows for substances to go through. Now, in the capillary beds, our capillary beds, like this picture that's shown, allows for fluid and white blood cells to pass from the bloodstream into the tissues. This is also where gas exchange is going to occur. All right, so they're in the capillaries. All right, oh, let me go back, I'm going to show you a picture. <clears throat> now our capillaries, if you notice, I like this picture a little bit because we have our arterioles that's leading into a capillary bed, and this is our capillary bed. 
And so we don't distinguish, is it an arterial capillary bed? Is it a venial capillary bed? It's just a capillary bed. And in that capillary bed is kind of the go-between between, between arterioles and venules, all right? Now arteries, we know our arteries and arterioles were delivering that blood to the organs, okay? Delivering that blood and all the good stuff that's in that blood, even the fluid, to those organs and those tissues. Now that flips us into talking about the veins. Now we're going to talk about the venous system. Okay, the venous system or the veins. Now our veins, um, if we look at our veins, they are blood reservoirs. They contain about 65% of the blood supply at any one given time. They are very structurally different than arteries. So two ways that they're structurally different than arteries. One is that they have very thin walls, okay, much, much thinner than arteries. Also, they have no muscle layer. So they don't have that muscle layer. So they do not vasoconstrict or vasodilate. Now in the arterial system, in the, art, the arteries, the blood pressure that was created by the heart and modified by the arteries is really the driving force of that blood through the arterial system. By the time that blood gets to the capillaries, if we were able to check the blood pressure there of the blood in the capillaries, we would see that there was hardly any blood pressure at all, okay? Now, veins, veins you wanna think that's our drainage system. Somehow we've gotta get all of that blood back to the heart, okay? In these veins that are structurally different than arteries and guess what? The blood pressure it's, it's minimal. It's very minimal to, to not, hardly nothing inside the veins. So now we've delivered that blood with the help of the pressure, right? Getting it to the organs and the tissues. But now that blood needs to return back to the heart. Um, but it doesn't have any pressure, okay? And it's going to flow in veins that can't vasoconstrict or vasodilate. So now we got to figure out how is it going to happen? What's going to happen here? Now, some of the adaptations. How, what, what are the adaptations that help get that blood that is flowing through the veins back to the heart? One adaptation is that the, vest, the, the veins, they have large diameter lumens. Okay, so larger diameter lumens if you have a large diameter lumen, that's going to decrease resistance. Okay, at this point, we don't want to increase the resistance of flow of blood. Okay, so the veins have very large lumens. Decreases the resistance, helps the flow of blood. Okay, another adaptation are valves. So veins have valves. Valves are pretty... Um, Interesting, as it turns out. Now, on the picture here, here you can see a valve. And they don't just have one valve, right? If I were to be able to zoom out of this picture, you'll see that every so often along the veins, they're gonna have a valve. And these valves are, that they're structurally, they kinda look like this. All right, so if this was the direction of flow, looking at my cursor, if this was the direction of the blood flow, okay, going up, right, the valve would be like this. Because let's think, we've got, we've got uh, capillary beds in our extremities, even down at our pinky toes. And all that blood, with no blood pressure, basically, has to get back to the heart, okay? And so, it, sometimes it even has to fight gravity, in order to get back up there, sort of. 
Now, let's think. If we have just a tiny bit of that blood flowing through the veins, all right, and these valves will open and close, open and close. And when those flaps close, it prevents the backflow of the blood. Pretty nice. So when they open, it allows for blood to go. And when it closes, it prevents that blood from getting any further back, prevents backflow. So that will help to move the blood to different segments. So we're moving it up, moving it up, moving it up, and all the way back to the heart. Now while we're here talking about valves, I want to flip on over here to this picture. Let's look. This is what it looks like when a valve is open and blood's going to flow, okay, into the next segment of that vein. Now what can happen sometimes? Now remember I said that uh, the wall, the veins have very thin walls and there's no muscle layer there. Now what can happen is that if there's a lot of pressure put on these veins and that could be from weight, extra excess weight, it could be any kind of pressure put on them upstream here and what can happen is lots of blood will pool in here and push on the walls and if it happens too long or too much those walls start to stretch out. Now we don't want our vein walls to stretch out. However, sometimes they do. This, because they do have these very thin, think of them like thin, delicate walls. Now, when that happens, if it's in place by a valve, notice it's getting real tough for that valve to close, right? And remember what valves do is they're going to prevent backflow. So what happens when it doesn't prevent the backflow and then the blood pools down to the last segment? Okay, it pools down to the last segment, it pushes on the walls and stretches out the walls and then it, some of it gets pumped up, valves can't close, now it pools back down. And you can imagine that pushing on the walls over and over again is going to dilate that inside lumen of the vein to a, sorry, to a point where those valves, the valves still might be here, but they're not functional. They're not preventing the backflow of the blood. And so the more and more blood in the vein, the more the vein becomes dilated the valve leaks and the blood flows backwards. And that can happen sometimes to veins. If you've ever heard of a varicose vein, okay, varicose veins, sometimes you'll see varicose veins on people's legs, okay? Um, and they kind of, they're kind of, they stick out, they're a little bumpy, they're sticking out from the skin. Um, they can be painful, okay, they can be painful. Um, we most often notice these dilated veins, these varicose veins, when they are close to the surface of the skin, but you can have that happen on the inside where you can't really see it as well. Now, once that happens to a vein, there's really no going back. You can't, this, can't, this isn't something that gets repaired okay, it, um, by our bodies. They will have to be surgically removed okay, or, or um, destroyed. They can be surgically removed or you can actually go in and destroy those veins and the blood will get rerouted. Oh, before we get there. All right, so I do want to correct one thing that I said that wasn't completely correct. So I said that in veins they have no muscle no true muscle layer they do have a, a a very thin smooth muscle layer it's nowhere near the the muscle layer of an artery but there is a muscle layer there so does it does it act in constricting and dilating that vessel no but it can it can uh, play a role in the integrity of 
that vein. All right. So <clears throat> next thing I want to talk about is mechanisms of venous return. We have two major mechanisms of venous return. Those are the muscle pumps and the respiratory pump. So as you can quite imagine, what we've been talking about is that um, getting that blood back to the heart in the veins is going to be a little bit difficult. And one of the adaptations that it has is those valves, right? The valves are going to help to prevent the backflow of that blood. Um, that very thin, smooth, smooth muscle wall in the veins, it, it, it may contract just a little, okay, but it's nothing like the arteries. Those in themselves isn't enough to get that blood back to the heart. Um, so we have two other mechanisms of ven venous return. So the muscle pump first. Let's talk about the muscle pumps. What the muscle pumps do is that when muscle contracts, and we think about the placement of these ve veins, and they're they're with they're within between muscles. And when the muscles when muscles contract, the gaster, the belly of the muscle gets thicker. We've talked about that. And when it does that, it squeezes on the blood vessel. It squeezes on those veins. Looking at the picture here, it squeezes on those veins and helps to move the blood. Okay, so if we're, it's, it's, that muscle pump is basically squeezing on the vein walls, squeezing on the vein, and helping to get, move that blood in one direction. Look at the little animation. Okay, when the muscle contracts, squeezes on that blood vessel. Okay, opens up those valves. Nice, and helps to move that blood into the next segment of that vein. So every single time that you are engaging your muscles, contracting your muscles, walking around, um, doing exercises, you're helping that, you're helping move your blood back to the heart. You're helping with that circulation. That's nice. So all those movements that you do, helping with your circulation. So you don't want to get up off the couch, getting real lazy, don't want to get out of bed and do anything. Just remember, even walking around, is going to help your circulation. Kind of cool. Now, if that wasn't cool enough, let me tell you about the next mechanism, and that is the respiratory pump. Now, we don't often think of this one, but the respiratory pump is helps out the veins of the thoracic and the um, and the abdominal cavities that are not typically surrounded by a lot of skeletal muscles. Now this resp respiratory pump is driven by the rhythmic changes in pressure in the thoracic and abdominopelvic cavities that occur with our ventilation. So look at this picture here on the left. We think of ventilation, that means moving air in and out of our lungs. So if we breathe in, Another name for that is called inspiration. If we breathe out, another name for that is called expiration. So during inspiration and expiration, we're changing the pressure in those cavities and creating a pressure gradient that pushes blood in the abdominal veins upwards. Okay, that's kind of cool. So us, the mere simple fact of us breathing in and out is going to help re return that blood to the heart. All right, so those are a little bit about the vessels and try to get that up. a little bit about the vessels. Now we talked about the vessels playing a role in that systemic blood pressure. Now, it's the vessels, vessels aren't the only determinant of our blood pressure. 
We also have to consider the cardiac output of the heart and even blood volume. So the systemic resistance, systemic vascular resistance, the cardiac output of the heart and even the total blood volume all play a role in our blood pressure. Now our blood pressure, overall blood pressure, <clears throat> there must be a um, a pressure gradient present at all times for the blood flow for our bodies. Now our blood pressure must be constantly maintained. It's going to fluctuate throughout the day depending on our activities and what we're doing, um, but our body works extremely hard to maintain that pressure gradient, to maintain that, that blood pressure and stay within those limits. Um, there are, there's, this is a huge coordinated event with not only the heart, which is going to create that blood pressure, but a lot of other systems and structures that are going to help us to maintain and control blood pressure. So when we usually think of blood pressure, we think of the heart, right? The heart is going to, it creates the blood pressure, um, but it's not the only one. We just learned about the blood vessels and how they can vasodilate and vasoconstrict in order to change up and help to maintain or control that blood pressure. If blood pressure gets too high or very low, it can be threatening to, it could be very life threatening. It is very life threatening. So the blood vessels play a role in that controlling of that blood pressure. The endocrine system, the endocrine system which secretes hormones and there are various hormones that play a role in controlling our blood pressure, maintaining it within normal limits and controlling our blood pressure. If our blood pressure gets too high or too low, there are hormones that help it return to those normal limits. The nervous system, we think of the nervous system, we think of the brain and the impulses that are being sent from the brain. Now you guys know all about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve stimulation and those neurons, those nerves can, will in, innervate blood vessels and cause them to vasoconstrict and vasodilate and then in turn have an effect on the blood pressure. And then another one we don't often think of when we think of blood pressure is the kidneys. The kidneys play a huge role in the maintenance and control of blood pressure. Now one of those factors that was considered um, that would a determinant of blood pressure was blood volume. Well, what are the organs that can help control our blood volume? That's our kidneys. Our kidneys are, are constantly filtering out the blood, right? That's their main job anyway and they are helping to maintain that blood volume. Okay, the kidneys will also help in other ways, um, even secreting some hormones to help maintain and control that blood pressure. Okay, so lots of factors, lots of structures and even whole systems that participate in controlling and maintaining our blood pressure. All right, so that concludes our lecture for today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great day.